Very good, very good. <clears throat> Why me? <laughs> How is this going to work? What, what, Wait just a minute. What just happened? What, why is this happening right now? Let's be honest. How often do we ask ourselves questions like these as we go through our daily life? Probably almost daily. Am I right? You know, I'm sure many questions like these rang through Mary's head as she received the news that she would be the mother of the Savior of the world. But Mary was also faced with a much bigger question that I am sure she asked herself many times through life. And that is the question, what child is this? As Mary first held baby Jesus in the stable in Bethlehem, I'm sure she asked herself, what child is this? As he went through his adolescent years, and we've read the story about his time in the temple with the religious leaders, I'm sure she asked herself, what child is this? And as he grew and became a man and went through his earthly ministries and she watched her son perform miracles and she heard the messages that he was sharing, I am sure she continued to ask herself the same question in amazement. And this is the question that we have been asking this Advent season because we all must answer this question for ourselves. This morning, we're going to seek to deepen our understanding of and love for our Savior by looking through the perspective of Jesus' own mother. You know, I came across this picture this week that we'll put up on the screen, and I just loved it and wanted to share what was written about this picture. Uh, below the picture it said, I love this portrayal of the nativity. Before the shepherds come rushing in, jabbering about an angel choir, before anyone showed up with gifts, there's just Mary, exhausted from childbirth, and Joseph, overwhelmed by the task in front of him. And the baby, the baby that changes everything. The quiet beauty of this moment stirs my heart every time I look at it. I love the pomp and the fanfare of Christmas and the chaos of family gatherings. I really do. But I cherish the quiet moments to stop and gaze at the baby. I too am exhausted and overwhelmed and he still changes everything. In the very first line of that Christmas carol, What Child Is This? The question is asked, What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? And then in the chorus of the song it says, This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste, to bring him laud or, or, or praise the babe, the son of Mary. Do you realize that that would have been Jesus' first identity on this earth? The son of Mary. What do you mean, Pastor Lane? Well, if we were to walk over to that nursery right now, and you were to ask me to describe any of the babies or toddlers in the nursery, other than giving you their name, what information could I tell you about them? who they belong to, right? Whose child they are. If I started pointing at the little babies in the nursery and saying, well, that right there is the accountant and he's the great athlete and she's the excellent pianist, you would all look at me like I was crazy and rightfully so because those things are not yet part of a baby's identity. When a child is born, the very first identity they have is the son of so-and-so, or the daughter of whomever. And that would have been Jesus' first identity as well, the son of Mary, or the son of Joseph. Now, for most babies, other than their given name, this is the only identity that they have from the womb. But this was not the case for Jesus. He actually had two complete identities from birth, as Mike just read. In Luke 1, verses 34 and 35, I'm going to read it again. Mary asked, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of 
God. You see, that was Jesus' other identity, the Son of God. And have you ever really thought about why this was important, why it was so important for Jesus to be born of a virgin? You know, the, what um, this idea has come to be referred to by biblical scholars as the hypostatic union of Christ. This week, if you're at family Christmas gatherings and you want to sound really intelligent, you can just say, isn't the hypostatic union of Jesus so amazing? And then wait and see, see how someone responds. No, don't do that unless you're going to explain what hypostatic union really means. You see, the word hypostatic, simply put, means personal. So the hypostatic union of Jesus is the personal union of Jesus' two complete natures, which are being fully God and fully man. You see, Jesus wasn't some weird combination being half God and half man. No, he was fully 100% God and he was fully 100% man. And we'll get into the importance of these two complete natures in a little bit. But first, let's take a look at scripture and see what evidence we have for Jesus having two complete natures. Now, when a child is born, some characteristics of a child's mother and father can be recognized and on display. Or at least that's what I've heard, although personally, I have always been horrible at, at telling, at recognizing that. Um, I remember when my son Kaysen was born, and people would come up to me, and, and I'm sure they went, met well, but they would come up and say things like, oh, he has your nose, and I wanted to respond, you think that little scrunched up thing looks like this? I just didn't see it. Or they would say, oh, he has your eyes. And I wanted to sarcastically respond, no, I'm sorry, you're mistaken. Those are his eyes. Mine are still in my head. Or, or I think the weirdest one I ever got, and once again, I'm sure this person meant well. But someone came up to me while I was holding Kaysen and they grabbed his little hand and they said to me, oh, he has your thumbs. <laughs> what am I, how am I supposed to respond to that? He has your thumb. I mean, is that a compliment? Is that an insult to my son? And, and what are you doing looking at my thumbs anyway? <laughs> and so even though I, I can't tell and I think it's kind of silly, I suppose it is true that every child does possess some characteristics, both physical and non-physical, of both their father and their mother. Now, in the passage we just read, the angel told Mary that what was conceived in her was not from man, but rather from the Holy Spirit of God. And the writer of Hebrews puts it this way in Hebrews 1, verse 3. It says, The Son, being Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being God the Father's being in nature. And that verse right there goes a long way in helping us answer our original question. What child is this? He is God in the flesh who embodies the exact representation of God the Father. Who conceived Jesus in the womb of Mary and therefore Jesus is not just a man but he was 100% God. This truth is immensely important to our faith and to the message of the gospel. Because if Jesus Christ was not fully God, then he could not have been the perfect eternal sacrifice for your sins and mine. You see, we read in Romans 3.23 that all of us have sinned and we all fall short of God's glory because God is perfect and he cannot be around that sin. So we fall short of God. And then in Romans 6.23, it says that the wages or the payment that must be paid for this sin debt that you and I have is death. And did you know, I know I've said this before, but there are only two forms of death that can pay for your sin debt in mine. The first is a finite being dying and suffering infinitely. And the second is an infinite being dying and suffering 
finitely. Church, get this. The finite being is you and me. And we would have to pay our sin debt infinitely for an eternity in hell. But praise God that he gave us a second option. And that is an infinite being, which is the perfect, sinless son of God, dying on the cross and paying finitely for your sins and mine. And that is why Jesus had to be born of a virgin and why it's so important that we understand and believe that he is God made flesh and has 100% the nature of God. But we're not done yet because you see Jesus Christ's second complete nature is just as important. And that is his human nature, which he received from his mother, Mary, which made him also 100% man. The Apostle Paul talks about this unique characteristic of Jesus being son of God and son of Mary. In Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, Paul said, In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow on heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, this idea of Jesus being fully God and fully man, I will admit, it, it's difficult for us to wrap our minds around, but it is absolutely foundational to our Christian faith. It is interesting because during the time that Jesus was on the earth, it was easy for those around him to see him physically, to touch him, to hear his voice, and therefore it was easy for them to believe in his humanity. But there were many people at that time who questioned his deity, who questioned if he was really God, including the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because in his physical appearance, he didn't glow, he didn't have a halo, he didn't look like anything other than a man. But then through his ministry and his miracles and fulfilled prophecy, and definitely through his resurrection— Many people came to believe in his deity, that he was God. But it wasn't long after he ascended into heaven that the doubts started to come from the opposite direction. You see, first-generation Christians who had not physically seen Jesus in bodily form started from a different place. They began with believing that Jesus was God, but tended to struggle with the fullness of his humanity. In fact, did you know that one of the first heresies, one of the first false doctrines that the young church faced was that Jesus was not truly a man? Uh, we can read about this in 2 John verse 7. John said, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is a deceiver and the Antichrist. So you see, this seesaw of beliefs has oscillated back and forth since the first century church and really for the last 2,000 years. Either some will try to make the argument that Jesus was not really God. He was just a good man. He was just a prophet. He was just a great teacher. Or others will try to make the argument that Jesus wasn't fully man. He was some sort of spiritual form who came to this earth. Um, he was an angel, or he was some extraterrestrial, like, like an alien or something. Um, and people will try to make these arguments for two reasons. One is because they don't want to submit to Jesus Christ as Savior of the world. And if he was just a man, like a prophet or a teacher, then they don't have to submit to that. Or two, because it's difficult for our finite human minds to wrap around this idea 
of Jesus having two complete natures. But let me ask this question. Isn't it actually good for our human minds to have difficulty completely understanding the person of Jesus? I mean, if it's easy for us to, to comprehend, to understand Jesus in all of his magnificence and glory, doesn't he kind of lose that magnificence as the savior of the world? And I don't ask that question to say that knowing Christ is not a worthy cause. We should absolutely seek to know Christ more and more. But we do have to accept that there are some magnificent things about Christ that are difficult for our human minds to understand. And we probably won't until heaven. And that includes Jesus having two complete natures, the hypostatic union of Christ. I also want to point out that some Christians today can spend so much time trying to convince our culture that Jesus really is God. And that's absolutely the truth, and it's absolutely important, but we therefore do not emphasize enough the importance of his humanity. You see, Pastor David Mathis put it this way, Jesus was like us in every respect, human body, human heart, human mind, and human will, except for sin. How amazing that the divine Son of God would not just take on part of our humanity at that first Christmas, but all of our humanity, and take that true humanity all the way to the cross for us. Jesus took a human body to save our bodies. He took a human mind to save our minds. Without becoming man in his emotions, he could not have rescued our hearts, and without taking a human will, he could not have saved our broken and wandering wills. He became man in full so that he might save us in full. He is truly a marvelous Savior. So just like there are reflections and attributes of his heavenly Father that are seen in Jesus, there are likewise reflections of Mary's life that are seen in her son. Let's look at just a few of these as we continue to answer our question, what child is this? And I want to focus um, not on the physical similarities that Jesus had with Mary, which I'm sure he did have, but let's be honest, we have no idea what those were. But I want to focus on the character traits that Jesus shared with his mother. First, both Mary and G Jesus displayed strong lives that were willing to receive a mission that included great faith in their heavenly father. You see, when Mary received the mission from the angel of the Lord to carry and conceive the son of God in her womb, have you ever really thought about what that moment must have been like for her? You see, Mary was a young lady who was engaged to be married to a hardworking carpenter. And I'm sure like every young lady, she had ideas in her mind of the life that she and Joseph were going to have together. But she received this unbelievable news from the angel Gabriel, and just like that, everything changed. When Mary received this life-changing news, there would have been so many ways that she could have responded. And if we put ourselves in her shoes and try to think how we would have responded, I'm not sure we would have responded as well as Mary did. Look at how she responded in Luke 1 verse 38. This is the first thing out of Mary's mouth. Well, first she asked, how can this be? But then this is how she responded. I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Wow, may your word to me be fulfilled. We see a parallel to this response from Jesus. When he was in the garden of Gethsemane praying about the mission to go to the cross and die for the sins of all humanity, he very much like his mother prayed a prayer of humble submission to the Heavenly Father. We read about this prayer in Luke 22, verses 41 and 42. It says, He, being Jesus, withdrew about a stone's throw from his disciples. He knelt down and prayed. And this is what Jesus said, Father, if you are willing, 
Take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Do you see the parallel between those two verses? Mary said, may your word to me be fulfilled. And Jesus said, yet not my will, but yours be done. Both Mary and Jesus were willing to receive a mission of great faith from the Heavenly Father and were willing to submit to that mission. The next parallel I see is both Mary and Jesus showed an unbelievable devotion to the ones whom they loved. When Jesus was suffering on the cross, never would his mother leave his side or turn her back on him. As it says in John 19 verse 25, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. In the same way, one of the most important characteristics of Jesus is the fact that he will never leave us or forsake us. In fact, one of the names of Jesus is Emmanuel, which literally translated means the God who is with us. And just like his mother Mary was with him at the cross, Jesus is with us in our darkest hour and our deepest pain. Jesus told his followers in Matthew 28, 20, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And that's awesome news. That is awesome hope for you and I. And the third parallel I would like to point out between Mary and Jesus is found in one of the most powerful scenes of compassion and care that is displayed between this mother and and her son. This scene is also found there in John 19, where Mary is near the cross of Jesus. And while Mary is seeking to be near, comforting and supporting her son, likewise we see the compassion and care of Jesus back towards his mother. Picking back up John 19, verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother there, so Jesus was on the cross, and when he saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved, being John, standing nearby, he said to her, woman, this is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. You know, the fourth candle there on our Advent wreath is called the candle of love. Christ's amazing, unconditional love for us. And what an incredible picture of love and compassion that Jesus displayed towards his mother. While he hung there dying on the cross with the sin of all the world on himself, he had the capacity to think of his mother and to make sure that his mother would be taken care of in his absence. And once again, that really helps answer our original question, what child is this? And what would he grow to become? Because he became the one who loved others and loved his family to the very end. He was selfless and sacrificing beyond measure. He was kind and considerate even when experiencing his worst day in the worst way possible. He came willingly to go through the worst pain and suffering imaginable so that we could become children of God. That is love. And church, get this. These same characteristics of Christ that we see in the life of Mary, we should strive to possess as well. Mary was not perfect. She was not God. She was not supernatural. But she possessed these amazing characteristics that we should strive for as well. So we all must answer these questions. Number one, am I willing to receive a mission that includes great faith in my heavenly father? Number two, do I show Christ-like devotion to the ones I love, to my family, to my church family? And number three, do I display a tremendous level of compassion and care for those around me? Even when I'm going through difficult circumstances myself, am I able to show this type of compassion and care for others?
You see, Christmas is not just about that child born in that manger because that child did not stay in that manger. He went on to live a perfect sinless life and then die on the cross for your sins and for mine. But praise God that his death is also not the end of the story. And I'm not trying to skip holidays here, but Jesus Christ also rose from the grave and therefore conquered sin and death. And his rebirth gives all of us the opportunity to be born again and saved from our sins. Church, get this. The Christmas story, this is what the Christmas story is really about, if I can sum it up in one sentence. The Son of God became the Son of Men so that the sons of men could become sons of God. And once we make the choice with our life, then we have the opportunity and the responsibility to become more like Christ, a process that is called sanctification. That's what we do after we take that step of salvation. And here are three great ways to do just that. Number one, through living on missions of faith in our Heavenly Father. Number two, through unbelievable devotion to the ones whom we love. And number three, through tremendous compassion and care for all of those around us. Those are three things that we saw in Mary and we saw in her son Jesus as well. You know, in the monologue we watched of Mary before the message, she mentioned many times this idea of being thirsty. She was obviously not talking about physical thirst, but about a thirst for something more in life, a bigger purpose, a greater cause that is outside of ourselves. And the truth is, this is a thirst that every single person on this earth has, and every single person on this earth is trying to quench. But this thirst will never be permanently quenched by anything of this world. Not money, not fame, not a career, not a relationship, nothing of this world can quench that thirst. The only thing that can truly satisfy that thirst is the correct answer to and submission to this all-important question. What child is this? He is 100% God and 100% man who came to this earth to be the savior of the world and desires to be the ruler of your life and mind. And there would be no better time than right now, this morning, to answer that question for yourself if you never have. But hear this, it's not enough to just answer this question in our minds. We must be willing to answer that question in our hearts and with our lives. What, what a tragedy it is that so many people will miss heaven by 18 inches. The distance from the head to the heart. You see, they know in their head who Jesus is. They know that they are a sinner, but they are unwilling to submit in their heart and with their life to Jesus as Lord. I pray that that would not be anyone who is here this morning. If you want to start that relationship with Jesus Christ, you know what it takes? It takes, like Jesus said on that cross, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Or like Mary said when she found out that she would be Jesus' mother, may it be done to me according to your will. We have to be willing to take ourselves off of the throne of our life and give up that control to Jesus. And that is my hope for everyone here this morning, this Christmas season. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you so much for the example that we have of Jesus who came to this earth being fully man and also fully God and lived a perfect sinless life, God. Jesus went through, he went through temptation. 
He went through emotion. He went through rejection. Anything of this life that we have to deal with, Jesus can relate to because he was fully man and he went through it himself. But I'm so thankful that he was also fully God so that he could be that perfect eternal sacrifice. And God, I thank you that by the bloodshed of Jesus, our sins can be covered and we can know you personally and we can come directly to you in prayer and we can have the hope, the assurance of an eternity with you. God, I pray if there's anyone here this morning who maybe they're hearing this for the first time or maybe they've been familiar with the Christmas story for a long time, but they have never submitted their life to you, God. I pray that this morning they would choose to do with just that. That this morning they would make that choice to say, God, I'm tired of doing my will. I'm tired of being thirsty and trying to quench that thirst with things of this world. God, I want you, the living water. I want to submit my life to you. I pray that they would make that choice this morning. And dear God, for all of us who have made that choice, I pray that we would be seeking to be more like you with our lives, God. And that that desire would go well beyond Christmas and would go throughout the year. God, thank you so much for the hope, the joy, and the love that comes from a relationship with you and from knowing you. And thank you for the opportunity that we have to celebrate that this Christmas season. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.